to make sure that people following each of those disciplines could also engage in a fruitful dialogue and participate in new ways of innovating, working together in interdisciplinary teams. Now, Design London, and the reason we've also come together this evening, is not simply just to stir those disciplines together, but to also do a bit of stirring for you all as well. But let me tell you who we've got lined up. We've got Irving Wodarski Berger. Irving has sat at the top table of IBM for many years at a corporate level. One of the very, very top team directing IBM's technical strategy, buying a super computing division, and leading so many aspects of it. IBM's transformation in recent years. Now, Irving, would, if IBM had ever had a role called the Chief Creative Officer, the CCO, Irving would have been able to fill that role admirably. In fact, that's what he in effect was. Um, Web 3.0, as you'll hear, is a very visual world. But the people who create such a visual world are not going to be just the computer engineers. So we have with us John Mabry. John started as uh, an artist, an experimental filmmaker, before Hollywood realized what he could do to transform Hollywood, and has created some marvelous films. You're going to see some clips of those this evening. Um, he directed Derek Jacobi and uh, Craig, uh, Daniel Craig. He most recently has been involved in a film, or has been directing a film, which stars Sienna Miller and Kieran Knightley, based on the, the life of Dylan Thomas. And his work is characterized by this painterly pride that creates worlds that truly immerse us. And will there be a way that these two things come together, the world of Irving and the world that John is able to paint in the cinema? Finally, we have uh, the enfant terrible. I should actually call him the long terrible now. Nigel's work is not iconoclastic, but he brings an iconoclastic insight into everything that he does. When um, James Joyce, in his semi-autobiography, the portrait of the artist as the young man, described art as being that conjunction of the intelligible and the sensual for an aesthetic purpose. I think that kind of uh, aspect has characterized the work of Nigel. Nigel's projects, many of you who would have been to the, um, the Dome during that great exhibition, not quite as great as the 1851 exhibition here, would have walked through the body and that was just one example of the astonishing work that Nigel has been involved in. Nigel was Professor of Architecture and Interior Design at the Royal College of Art. So we have quite a, an amazing combination to study. Of this Web 3.0. By the way, there is no agreement on the name Web 3.0, but it fits very nicely with Web 2.0, where there is agreement with the name. And the key characteristic of Web 3.0, which is very much shown by the little clip of Second Life that Nick showed you, is that it's a much more visual and immersive web that not only can you interact with information and can you interact with other people, but you do that in a much more visual way as opposed to the more textual and even just static image way of the previous versions of the web. Now, in Second Life, as in many other virtual worlds, the stuff that you saw is created by the people that use the virtual world. Sometimes it's the users themselves that have the skills to create. Other times, they, it's somebody else does it for them, whether it's designing the buildings or the avatars. So we're even beginning to see the creation of things in the web, which in the previous versions we called programming. This is still programming, 
But now it's a much more visual, much more experiential type of programming. But it was a magical thing to get the first real film back, and then slowly I became more ambitious based on the longer films. And I had a few shows um, at the ICA. I think my first one was in 1981, and that continued through to about 1984-85. But along the way, one of the shows, um, which was called The Cultural Impotence of Stupid Boys, got, um, got a rave review, bizarrely, in The Times. And I'd gone along to an exhibition at this place, which was called the Olympus Gallery, which Olympus Cameras had opened at that time. And this guy had read the review in the Times. He obviously hadn't seen the show. Um, but he was kind of impressed that I'd had this very good review for this exhibition and said, would you like a video camera? And I was like, mm, OK. And what we started to do was to project the Super 8 films. We filmed them, used two projectors. And we got into a very elaborate, we thought, a very high-tech, we thought, approach to filmmaking. Anyway, to cut a long story, a little shorter, um, that led me into by accident. I was very snobby for a long time about music videos, and I thought that that was the last place an experimental filmmaker should go. And then a group called Everything But The Girl in 1984 asked me to do a video for them, and I found out how much money you got paid. <laughs> so I was like, okay. And I did a couple of videos for them, and they were fairly successful. And then um, some other friends started to ask me to do videos for them, and one of those was a fantastic girl called Nana Cherry. And for her, I did a video for this, a song called Buffalo Stunts, which a lot of criticism was around at that time of our pop videos that they were just wallpaper. And so I decided I would use a book of wallpaper samples behind Nana as she was performing the song Buffalo Stunts. I think we're all trying to push the boat out in some way. We're all trying to discover new things. I, for one, would get bored if I didn't discover something. Even a tiny little thing was new each day. And uh, I, I, I'm guessing why Nick has invited me, but I guess that a certain aspect that I want to get across to you tonight is the way that architecture is uh, actually a free-spirited uh, manifestation. It can be virtual, it can be physical, it can be in a story, it can be in a movie, it can be in a computer game. In actual fact, it's kind of the elephant in the room. It is uh, the, what you're talking about is a certain kind of framework, certainly Irving is talking about a framework within which events can happen. Um, and I've spent my life as a teacher and an architect trying to broaden the definition, the understanding of what architecture can be, uh, and trying to move beyond the object of architecture, the styles of architecture, and think about the relationship between experience and action and what uh, a, a room or a building can do in order to uh, coexist, or perhaps sometimes to provoke those actions. So I've freely played with ideas and sometimes fiction, or what I call narratives, about buildings or cities or rooms. And one of the, uh, and there are many, many of them that I've, that I've attempted, some of them have got built, and some of them uh, exist purely in writing and in books. And one of these, uh, let's say, experimental forms of architecture is uh, uh, a concept of mine called ecstasy, which has manifested itself variously as two or three exhibitions and a book and even a guide to this place, which, like a time out guide to London or New York, is a physical object, but that physical object can be explored as it intended to be explored as though Exeter City was a real place. 